Start them up the strooms. Starting them up the strooms. What is up, ladies and gentlemen, twerkers, jerkers, lurkers, witches, liches, and bitches? It is time once again for Johnson Blackwood's Do's the Drawings. But back again with another humble dono strooms. Because. Taking up some donations to help uh, get some gas money. He's like, uh, Melody has already. <laughs> Melody's a fucking rock star. Jeebus fucking crunch cereal. Has uh, pulled me out of the hole as she usually is at, often does. But this is like one of the deepest holes I've been in for a while. And it comes shortly after me paying off my cabin. I'm finally glad to have that done. But I got some surprise charges from HughesNet earlier this morning. And I'm in the process of having that resolved and getting reimbursed. But until then, I got to deal with the charges. So I got some important bills coming out tomorrow. And Melody has ensured that I'll be able to make those payments thank you love you're fucking awesome and um but uh, i'm still keeping up with the um donation stream because in order to resolve this HughesNet issue i have to drive all the way to a ups station which is a two-hour drive away and i want to ensure that i have the gas money to do so So here we are. Back at it again. Oh, shoot. I should fucking sling the links around again. Copy. Let's tweet this. Continued. Donation streams continued. Whoops. Tweet, tweet, tweetly, tweet, tweet, tweetly. Okay, there we go. The word is out there. Oh, fucking hell, it's getting warm again. Did, did I do the right? Yeah, I did. Okay. Uh, Melody says, can you call UPS and have them pick it up for a, for a small collection fee? Um, I, I guess I can inquire about it, but I don't know. I can, I can call and ask, but we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll ask tomorrow during business hours. Right now, just work on the stream. I've never done that before. And seeing as how I live in a very rural, out-of-the-way area, it's like my, my assumption is that they won't. But, um, but since they make deliveries here, like maybe they will. If, if the fee, the collection fee is smaller than the gas money I'd have to expend, then it, it'll be worth it. The gas money and time. Check my Discord. Schedule a pickup. Oh, wait. Hmm. Wait. 
would they be able to do the tracking number and stuff through a pickup? Fuck. Items that weigh more than 70 pounds. Egg. Hmm. Oh, geez, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll look into this later. It's, it's more than I want to, like, study right now. the runny nose. Sweet. This is looking pretty, pretty cool. I'm gonna have to adjust the colors on my my tablet. Some of these grays don't display properly.
Oh, nice. Okay, let's get back to this. That's not the one. This one. This is the one we were working on. Let me pull up some audio. I was listening to this before I jumped back on, so... I didn't even continue. think. I just did it. And if I had not done it, and if they had been able to get away, they would have killed me. With regards to the public statements she made, Patty claimed that she had been writing the yes, SLA Dono version of part two. and had been punched in the face by one of her captors when she refused to be more militant in her words and actions. She also claimed to have been repeatedly violated by her captors for even the smallest of infractions. When news of these allegations reached the surviving SLA members, they were outraged and claimed that Patty had been in a romantic relationship with one of the men she'd accused. It was even alleged that Patty had been given a stone trinket by the man and had been so close to him that she kept the carving with her in her jail cell. This trinket was later paraded before oh, the man. jury, who thank saw you for it as the powerful street, evidence thank you for the donation, um, despite claims she believed it was a pre-Columbian <laughs> artifact of archaeological significance. Very much appreciated, yo. Despite appeals for mercy, you, Patty was convicted that, of the bank robbery that, that'll be March 20th for the, of um, That'll be enough for the... for the gas money, some road snacks, and, and lunch. Jeez, like fucking awesome kick ass, yo. I I don't know who it is. It just says coffee supporter, and when I looked in the in the messages, it's like um, the user is just a garble of some <laughs> some letters. But yeah, much appreciation for the anonymous anonymous stuff, uh, anonymous um, donation. Thank you. You're fucking awesome. Six. You and Melody. Like, you and Melody, like, fucking saved my ass today from having to deal with um, overdraft fees. And I got bills coming out tomorrow, starting tomorrow. And this HughesNet shit early this morning just really, really put a sour mood on the morning. But, yeah, I'm, I'm like, like goal, goal achieved and then some. Thank you very much, you two. Uh, all right. Onwards. And was handed the maximum sentence of 35 years imprisonment. However, this was later reduced to seven years, after another judge declared the original sentence to be overly harsh. Almost immediately after her arrival in prison, Patty had to undergo emergency surgery after suffering a collapsed lung. But curiously, the same... I'm sorry, I feel like I should celebrate more, but I'm like <laughs> fucking borderline tired. Um, before I got this bad news, I decided to stay up late last night, binge watching Saul, Better Call Saul. So I, I, I'm okay, but um, I got like a decent enough amount of sleep. But I think like I'm an hour sleep shy of just running on fumes, but I'm I'm good. I'm good. But yeah, like fucking, <laughs> like huge, huge weight lifted off my chest and shoulders thanks to Melody and Anonymous Donor. Like, you guys are awesome. Kick ass. Both of you kick so much ass for saving mine. Condition prevented her from appearing at the trials of two of her former SLA comrades. Then, after... Oh. Brex till Andrew asks, no monster to keep you going? No, I, I've been kind of like, like really running low on cash. Like I, I've only been able to like, well, I only keep one dedicated client as far as commissions go. And that's Melody. And the rest of the time I'm like doing schoolwork. So I got to juggle the two and I'm making enough to get by. But like when fucking something comes out of the out of left field, like the whole HughesNet charges came through today, like it really threw me for a loop. But um, leading up to then, like leading up to now, I've just been kind of like taking it easy on like uh, getting snacks and like energy drinks. I've, I've been getting some like snacks funds, but I'll spend, you know, like just enough 
like pulled me over for the next few days. Like I haven't been like splurging on like a large supply. Like as you can see, like one of those shelves, that's where I used to keep all my noodles. I've been fucking dry from noodles for a long while now. But uh, yeah, like um, I, I drank my last energy drink uh, earlier yesterday and I decided to like do a binge watching of Saul, Better Call Saul. Saul, Better Call Saul. <laughs> Mel just says, you're lucky I'm a patient cat. Yes, she is. She's been so patient with me. Like, the, let, let me let me show off like one of the last, like one of the recent pieces I did for Melody. And this one took me a while because again, I'm like juggling school, school work and commission work. But I, I think it came out pretty good. Fairly nice. Nice, uh, nice one. And this is the, not that one. This is the other one I am working on for her. Very, very detailed. I'm going to go in on the feathers and like really detail them out. And there's still quite a ways to go. Like overall, the image is almost done, but there are still several details I want to really go over. And there's going to be a sword in the image. There it is. Freak, huge honking thing. And I want to just um, make that just as good, if not better than this one. Like this one is, you know, I, I like it. I, <laughs> I like how it came together. Get all those turns and contours and whatever. The shininess. But yeah. Melody's been super patient with me. But I'll be glad to have all the schoolwork done and out of the way and have my certificate. But this is my last semester, so <laughs> I, I'm doing good on it. They're really good. There's still st some writing assignments, which I'm not a fan of, but since my uh, computer technologies teacher isn't like a stickler for like grammar and stuff, we can more or less turn in whatever as long as whatever we turn is, ha whatever we turn in has some substance. You know, you can't like just like type up some bullshit about like, <laughs> like I can't turn in like a, like a poem or like something I wrote like, ages ago and like expect to pass no he's going to review them and just as long as they have like uh substance and like knowledge akin to like what we're what the assignment is like um he doesn't care he doesn't give two shites about grammar punctuation and that stuff so uh oh and we, we don't have to like really like go in depth of like citing sources and footnotes oh my god i hated that so much but yeah this 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 the second semester is shaping up to be a bit easier and um i'll still be glad to like be done with it that way i can just jump back into commission work and all that all that good stuff melody says isha's sword on his back is the one we're drawing nice sounds sounds like he's a good yeah he is like he's he's already been through some of that bullshit with like professors where it's like um he was he was talking about this one story about a professor oh a professor was like wanting like assignments turned in on his desk at a certain time like before he started 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 a class and like um this student like ran late and it was understandable why he ran late there's like some things that just kind of got in his way he couldn't get to cl class on time but once he got to class he put his paper on the desk on his professor's desk and his professor saw that he picked up the paper and said i wanted this paper turned in before class started today class has already started like 15 minutes ago it's like oh well i'm sorry there's like i had to deal with this and that and whatever and like well that's not my problem it's your responsibility as a student to like make sure stuff like that doesn't happen or get in your way blah 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 this and that and he just like tosses the paper in the trash i'm like fucking dude 
the fucking real world the real world doesn't like fucking work like that it's like yeah you might show up late to like a, a job or a meeting but then you're excused as long as you have like a legitimate enough excuse like as long as you don't fucking stagger in hung over and shit but like fucking like a job won't tell us like well it's your responsibility like i don't care if you fucking broke your leg or your car broke down blah 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 it's your responsibility to show up on time and be here and make your money uh well you're, well you're done for the day like uh, go home <laughs> without pay blah 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 like fucking like life isn't that harsh like why do some of these professors like feel like it's necessary to have a fucking stick up their butt i mean geez like just because some professor, when they were going through it, like fucking treated them like shit, doesn't give them carte blanche to do the same thing to their students. I have a little bit of compassion, man. Asshole professors. But yeah, like my, my professor right now, he's he's nothing like that. So he's pretty cool. He's really lenient. And as long as you're doing the work, you'll be good. Anyway. Anyway. After she finally agreed to testify. Hold on. I'm going to sneeze. Fucking sneeze tease, man. The prison took no special security okay. measures for her safety until she found a dead oh, yeah, rat on, on this her bunk on the day of an no, SLA member's here. hearing. Patty's brainwashing defense was revisited years later, after Representative Leo Ryan was murdered while visiting the Jonestown settlement in Guyana. By happenstance, he had been collecting signatures on a petition for Patty's release in the weeks before his murder, and the incident garnered the attention of none other than legendary actor John Wayne. Wayne pointed out the contradiction in the public accepting that Jim Jones had brainwashed 900 individuals into taking their own life en masse but refusing to believe that the SLA could have brainwashed a young and impressionable teenager. The actor's plea touched the hearts of many who were skeptical of Patty's brainwashing claims, and it prompted President Jimmy Carter to secure her release from prison eight months before she was eligible for her first parole hearing. Patty later recovered full civil rights when President Bill Clinton granted her a pardon on his last day in office. It's almost impossible to determine the exact truth of Patty Hearst's kidnapping, and if she really believed in the Symbionese Liberation Army's core ethics. But if it's true, if she really was brainwashed by her captives, the implications are terrifying. There's no doubt that Patty came from an especially privileged background, but by all accounts, she was still just a regular teenage girl. But once she was a prisoner of a group of deranged radicals, all it took was a few days of starvation and torture, and that regular teenage girl was gone. Damn. On November 1st of 1955, United Airlines Flight 629 took off from Stapleton Airport in Denver, Colorado at 6.52 p.m. It had been bound for Portland, Oregon, but the doomed flight would never arrive as just 11 minutes after takeoff. All 39 passengers and five crew members were instantly killed when their plane crashed on a sugar beet farm near Longmont, Colorado. As news of the tragedy spread like wildfire across the nation, the FBI volunteered itself to undertake any upcoming investigation into the crash. Oh, uh, what's going on? <laughs> that nearly sneezed, but then it doesn't come. Yeah, <laughs> Why, body, why? Or the sudden sneeze that makes you bite your tongue on the inside of your cheek. Oh, fuck. Or the inside of your cheek. Yeah, I hate, I hate those. The following day, while the victims' bodies were still being identified, an FBI scientist was sent to the scene to conduct an examination of the wreckage. He discovered that the tail section of the plane had been cleanly severed from the rest of it. So cleanly it was as if it had been cut with a knife, and that it had fallen with only minor damage approximately one and one half miles from the main crash site. The scientists also ruled out the possibility of an explosion due to malfunction, and noted that the plane seemed to have been in perfect working condition when it took off on its final flight. Less than a week later, 
the Civil Aeronautics Board Chief of Investigations officially stated that there were indications of sabotage and invited the FBI to open up a criminal investigation into the 44 murders which took place that day. The very next day, the FBI ordered at least a dozen of its agents to work on the case full time, and over the weeks that followed, four teams of interviewers questioned almost two dozen different people in order to gather witness testimonies. Witnesses claimed that the initial explosion had occurred while the plane was operating in a routine manner, and that it appeared to have been of tremendous Man, force, causing fiery streamers nerves. to fall from the plane. A second explosion, probable of one or more fuel tanks, had occurred when the engines and forward compartment of the plane struck the ground. The scientists ordered that the investigative team recover as many pieces of the wreckage as they could, and bit by bit, the plane was then reassembled in a kind of giant jigsaw puzzle at a nearby warehouse. And this served two purposes. Firstly, reassembling the wreckage would allow investigators to identify the exact location of the explosion that caused the crash. But the process would also allow investigators to identify and isolate any foreign materials that may have constituted an explosive device. Before the wreckage was even fully assembled, investigators were able to determine that the explosion had occurred in the plane's fourth cargo pit, meaning that the detonation had originated in a piece of luggage loaded onto the plane at Denver Airport. As the analysis of the plane's wreckage continued, investigators discovered five small fragments of sheet metal were found which could not in any way be identified with parts of the plane or known contents Revenge of the, of the cargo. Sneezing, yes. These fragments were coated Sneezing with a kind too, of gray soot associated back. with an explosion, and one of them was determined to have come from a type of 6-volt battery, the kind one might use to power a remote detonator. It became evident that a downing of Flight 629 was no tragic accident. It was a devastating, deliberate act of murder involving the smuggling of a bomb onto the plane. As the investigation progressed, FBI agents began to profile the lives of each innocent victim. They interviewed hundreds of their family members, friends, and employers, hoping to identify any potential motive for homicide. Agents also set about poring over the remains of the victim's luggage and personal effects. It was during this process that something intriguing came to light. On board the doomed aircraft that day was a woman by the name of Daisy E. King and after recovering and collating a series of personal letters, newspaper clippings, an address list, and two keys for safety deposit boxes, investigators were able to put together a detailed picture of her life and family. One of the newspaper clippings revealed that her son, Jack Gilbert Graham, was wanted on charges of forgery dating back to 1951. This might not have been all that alarming on its own, but the petty financial crime became all the more interesting once agents conducted another piece of analysis. A large effort was made to identify victims who'd had large travel life insurance policies taken out in their name prior to the fatal flight. This is how agents discovered that Daisy E. King had no less than three large policies in her name, something they found highly suspicious considering most other passengers had no more than two. When such compelling evidence was presented to a federal judge, a search warrant was quickly drawn up to authorize the search of Jack Gilbert Graham's home. During the search, police officers recovered the paperwork for a 40... <laughs> yeah, these sound like bad B-movies. The Sneezing 4, this time it is slugs. Part 4 is when it went off the rails and became a bit supernatural. <laughs> Like gelatinous aliens just pouring out of your nose. Thousand dollar travel insurance policy that Jack had taken out on his mother in the months before she died. It was also discovered that Jack had recently hired an attorney to rewrite his mother's life insurance policy, naming himself the recipient of the vast majority of his mother's estate. After interviewing friends and family members, FBI agents learned that Jack and his mother had an extremely fraught relationship, and during his teenage years, Jack often found himself homeless after a particularly violent argument occurred. Agents also learned that Jack and his mother had reunited later in life to operate their own drive-in restaurant, but that the venture had almost failed on account of their volatile relationship. 
One Jeez. former friend of Daisy's mentioned that Jack had apparently caused a small explosion at the restaurant after one altercation, and that he had repeatedly been caught pilfering money from the registers. After the FBI began delving into Jack Gilbert Graham's history, agents discovered a number of pertinent and disturbing details. An associate of Graham's mentioned how he'd once performed demolition work in the U.S. Navy and that Graham had once purchased a brand new truck, took out an insurance policy on it, then wrecked it under suspicious circumstances almost immediately afterward. FBI agents also discovered the details of Graham's forgeries, learning he committed the crimes while employed as a payroll clerk for a factory in Denver. Graham had stolen a number of blank checks, forged the name of the company owner, then cashed the checks for approximately $4,200 in cash. God Graham damn. was convicted of the forgeries on November 3rd of 1951, but the sentence was suspended, and he had been placed on probation for a period of five years. Graham might have dodged a spell in prison, but the financial restitution broke his proverbial bank, and there's no doubt that this left him a very desperate man. FBI agents first interviewed Graham just over a week after the bombing, with a particular interest paid. Fucking hell, I'm a desperate man, and I wouldn't stoop to shit like that. Jeez. Um, knowledge says, has more sequels than Halloween, Friday the 13th, and Nightmare on Elm Street combined. Yes, the sneeze. The sneezing. <laughs> uh to the small explosion that had occurred at his mother's restaurant. Graham stated that the explosion was caused by someone disconnecting a gas line and describing how the gas had filled the room until it reached a pilot light on a water heater, igniting the gas and causing the explosion. He had vehemently denied that he might have been involved in the explosion, and due to the interview taking place on a purely voluntary basis, Investigators were forced to pursue a different line of questioning so not to rile Graham up too much. Questions then turned to the contents of his mother's luggage, and although Graham denied knowing what she'd packed, he seemed to suggest that she may have been in possession of a large amount of shotgun shells and rifle ammunition, and that she intended to use them to hunt caribou in Alaska. The fact that Graham seemed to know that an explosion had occurred, and that he also seemed to know how it occurred, uh -oh. was something investigators found deeply suspicious. <laughs> and after Graham's idiot. wife was questioned, the evidence against him became considerably more damning. Gloria Graham shared two children with Jack and confirmed that his mother had been living with them in the time before her death. She also mentioned that on the day she died, Jack had given his mother a present, a box believed to contain a small set of tools for forming seashells into art objects, Gloria recalled that this package was the size of a large shoebox and wrapped up in decorative paper, and that Jack insisted on packing the gift into her suitcase as a surprise. Gloria also mentioned that after dropping his mother off at the airport, Jack had been pale and nauseous. She asked him if everything was okay, but her husband brushed her concerns off by telling her that he'd eaten some bad food. Then, after receiving news of his mother's death, Jack didn't seem like he was grieving properly. In fact, he seemed vexed by something. He was barely eating or sleeping, and he spent most of his time walking up and down both inside and outside their home. Jack Graham's half-sister also had a lot to say about him, telling FBI agents that he had a warped, morbid sense of humor, and had actually witnessed Jack assaulting his wife. She also confirmed that, although she'd never seen any evidence of it, her half-brother had boasted of his experience in manufacturing explosives. On November 12th of 1955, the FBI invited Jack and Gloria down to their offices under the pretense of their assistance being required. The next day, they voluntarily appeared at the Denver FBI office, where they were shown fragments of Daisy's luggage. The couple were as helpful as can be, and were treated as nicely as possible by the attending agents, but... At the conclusion of the appointment, the agents told Jack that they wished to interview him further concerning several aspects of the case. A particular interest to the agents was Jack's suggestion that a box of ammunition might be to blame for the explosion, and their follow-up questions concerned the gift Jack had given his mother on the day of the plane crash. Jack then contradicted his wife's previous statement, 
and told the FBI that he had not given her a set of crafting tools on the day of her departure. At first, Jack was indignant in the face of the FBI's insinuations. I gave her dynamite! He once again grew pale when the agents asked him what he had done with his mother upon driving. Uh, Brex Talange says, I have to ask, was this character Chi from Chobits inspired? Yes, inspired by Chobits from Clamp Studios. Got another notification. Holy shit. What? <laughs> like some of these donations aren't popping up <laughs> in the stream. But like uh is it the same? Yeah, like uh thank you, random coffee supporter. <laughs> yeah, your 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 donations are very appreciated. Like uh, you and Melody like fucking dug me out of that freaking pit that Husnet put me in. Like that you guys you guys are fucking awesome. But yeah, we reached our goal. We fucking I reached the goal and then some. Thank you. Thank you very much. This uh, melody says Angel was more so inspired by Chi. Yes. Her to the airport. When the agents produced a copy of a travel insurance policy that Jack's mother had bought prior to her flight, he had no choice but to admit that he'd made himself the sole beneficiary. Shortly after the interview, Graham was informed that he was a suspect in the case. He refused to submit to a polygraph test, but gave the FBI his consent to search his home, automobiles, and property. During the search of Graham's home, a small roll of copper wire with yellow insulation was located in a shirt pocket of some work clothes. Experts agreed that the wire appeared to be the type used in detonating primer caps. When confronted with the evidence of his bomb making, Jack broke under the pressure and admitted planning the explosive device, killing 43 people in order to ensure his mother's death. Fuck. He went on to describe how he'd used a time bomb composed of 25 sticks of dynamite, two electric primer caps, a timer, and a 6 volt battery. You fucking serious? 43 people in order to ensure his mother's death. He went on to describe how he'd used a time bomb composed of 25 sticks of dynamite. 25 sticks! Jesus! Well, there's no kill like overkill, but fucking hell, dude. Did you really hate your mom that much? Were you that desperate for money? Jeez! That's dark. <laughs> okay. 25 sticks. Like, no, you couldn't use one. No. No, not just one. Like, I'm pretty sure one would have, like, fucking burst the fuselage. And it would have went down anyway. But maybe he was trying to ensure that everyone didn't suffer by using 25 whole fucking sticks. Good lord, man. You're fucking twisted, dude. Oh... You're, that that that's just crazy. This this dude is fucking in fucking insane. Might two electric primer caps, a timer, and a six volt battery. Jack Graham had already admitted his guilt, but at his first court hearing on December 9th of 1955, he claimed he was innocent by reason of insanity, before, during, and after the alleged commission of the crime. Yeah, because insane people aren't as, like, like so meticulous to fabricate a freaking explosive device. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't sound insane. Like, fucking... He might not be insane, but he's definitely, like, a fucking raging sociopath, man. But he says, clearly you don't listen to trash metal, or thrash metal, then. <laughs> Yeah, I don't listen to enough thrash metal. I'm sorry, love. 
Graham was then examined by doctors at the Colorado Psychopathic Hospital, and during an interview with one of the doctors, he claimed that he'd concocted his entire confession. He claimed that he'd gotten the idea from a photograph he'd seen in an FBI agent's office, one which depicted the apprehension of the Nazi saboteurs who had landed on the Florida coast during World War II. In the background of the picture, a trio of FBI agents are digging up a cache of dynamite that had been buried on a beach, and Jack claimed that his fractured mind had latched onto the idea of explosives. Despite his assertions of being mentally unwell, Graham was found legally sane by all four psychiatrists and he was taken back to the Denver County Jail. For almost two months, Graham was a model prisoner, and his jail time was mostly spent quietly reading or chatting with the guards. But just after 5.30pm on February 10th, 1956, the sheriff's deputy, tasked with keeping an eye on Graham's cell block, heard an unusual sound coming from one of the cells. After further examination, the deputy determined the sound was coming from Jack Graham's cell, and when he opened the door, he found that Graham had tried to strangle himself with a pair of socks. The deputy quickly untied the makeshift garrote, saving Graham's life before he was transported to the prison's hospital. Yeah, that's dark. It's like, when you're in an environment like that, sure, like, stuff like that crosses your mind. I mean, with me, like, I had, like, um, blood pressure pills. And it's like a... Like, blood pressure will, like, kill you either way, like, if it's too high or too low. If it's too high, it'll kill you slowly, which is why I need to, like, continue doing push-ups and stuff. I've been kind of, like, taking a break because I've been getting, like, severe cramps beginning of this week. So I'll, I'll probably jump back into it, like, next week. But, um, like, uh, back to the whole blood pressure thing. If, if it's too high, it'll kill you slowly, but if it's too low like you'll just fucking go to sleep and just fucking pass away so that that was like like uh one of those thoughts that like passed my mind <laughs> it would, it would, i'd revisit it revisit it every now and then when when that environment got too much i would think like if i took more than the recommended dose i'd just fucking slowly just fade away in my sleep doesn't sound so bad, but clearly I didn't do it. But yeah, your mind does wander to those escapes, <laughs> if you can call it that. Uh, anyway. Once Graham regained consciousness, he was placed in a straitjacket, then taken to the Shit. psychiatric ward of Colorado he lived. General Hospital, where he was strapped to a bed with four guards posted nearby. Then, as the days went by, Graham stunned psychiatrists by talking freely and honestly about his involvement in the bombing. He admitted that the whole scheme had been a plot to kill his mother, and that he didn't feel an ounce of remorse for taking almost 50 other people with her. Cold-blooded. I realized that there were about 50 or 60 people carried on that kind of plane, but the number of people to be killed made no difference to me. It could have been a thousand, he said. When that time comes... There's nothing they can do about it. On February 24th of 1956, Graham finally dropped the insanity plea and was returned. Jesus, like fucking your excuse was, well, they're going to die anyway. Like, what the hell kind of fucked up logic is that, man? Anyway. Turned again to Denver County Jail. His April 16th trial set an all-time record for the state of Colorado and the number of jurors examined. In all, 231 were called, and the final jury represented a cross-section of American life. It included two housewives, one a former beauty queen, two typists, a movie executive, an Gotta engineer, get that beauty a truck queen driver, in there. a sales lady, a telephone man, a lithographer, a bookkeeper, and a salesman. On the first day and almost throughout the trial, hundreds of people waited for hours in the halls outside the courtroom, hoping for a chance to get seats. They brought their lunches, afraid to leave the room for fear of losing their places. The guard at the door, however, saved a seat for one woman who arrived promptly at 9am each morning. She was an attractive, young-looking woman who 
just so happened to be the wife of the United Airlines pilot of the ill-fated flight, who sat only a few feet from Graham throughout the trial. <laughs> the accused remained calm as the trial progressed, and although Graham had lost weight since his arrest, he still looked relatively healthy. He slouched in his chair, chewed gum, and even joked with his legal team, all while a district attorney described him as a straight-up monster, someone who had taken the lives of almost 50 people, including his own mother, coldly, carefully, and deliberately. Finally, on May 5th of 1956, the jury took just an hour to find Jack Gilbert Graham guilty of murder in the first degree, with a recommendation that he receive the penalty of death. The judge then sentenced him to be put to death in late August of 1956, and after a brief stay at the Colorado State Penitentiary, Graham was executed in the gas chamber at 8 p.m. on Friday, January 11th of 1957. The bombing of Flight 629 is arguably one of the worst single acts of mass murder in American history, but it isn't the death toll that makes it one of the most infamous. It's that a man wanted to get away with the murder of his own mother, so much that he thought nothing of killing 43 other people in the process. Click the join button to become a member today for exclusive content. Man. Just before... The guy's mom must have been like a real fucking bitch. I'm glad I don't have a mother like that. My mom's a sweetheart. She... My only, my only criticism is that she cares too much because she, like, overfeeds me. <laughs> fucking makes me these huge fucking breakfast burritos. Like, I, I can't eat the whole thing, Mom. And then she gives me, like, a like a teasing, like, um, guilt trip. Like, fine, if you don't want my cooking, then. Like, oh... Mom, okay, I'll eat it. And I eat it, and it's like so much food, and then I'm miserable. <laughs> but yeah, anyway. 11 a.m. in Kansas City on September 28th of 1953, a nun working at a school for small children was confronted at the school's front entrance by a woman claiming to be the aunt of a child named Bobby Greenlees. Six-year-old Bobby was the son of Robert Greenlee Sr., a wealthy businessman who lived in the affluent Kansas City suburb of Mission Hills. The woman, claiming to be Bobby's aunt, was visibly upset when she told the nun that Bobby's mother had been rushed to the hospital after suffering a heart attack. The nun later recalled that when she'd fetched Bobby, he walked directly to the woman without hesitation, and there was no reason to doubt that the woman was his aunt. The woman then took Bobby by the hand, then led him towards a waiting taxi. About a half hour later, a different nun called the Greenlease family to express the school's condolences to them. The voice on the other end sounded surprised. Mrs. Greenlease hadn't suffered a heart attack, and there was no way his aunt could have collected him from school. Despair set in once both parties realized that Bobby had been kidnapped and after the Kansas City Chief of Police begged the governor for as much Shit. assistance as possible, the FBI was called in to investigate. One of the first witnesses questioned by federal agents was a Kansas City cab driver named Willard Pearson Creech. Willard told the agents that on the morning of the kidnapping, a woman fitting the description of Bobby's kidnapper climbed into his cab then asked him to drive her to the Katz Drugstore at Westport and Main Street in Kansas City. After waiting approximately six minutes, the cab driver watched as the woman re-entered the cab accompanied by a small boy that looked just like little Bobby. A few hours after the kidnapping, the Greenleases received the first ransom letter, which demanded $600,000 in exchange for the boy's release. The letter also stated that if the money was handed over within 24 hours, and there was no funny business, Bobby would be returned safe and sound. A second ransom letter was delivered the following day and contained Bobby's Jerusalem medal to prove the kidnappers were serious. The letter assured them that Bobby was homesick, but otherwise okay, and reiterated the kidnappers' demands for $600,000. 
The final communication between the green leases and the kidnappers was a telephone call received after the cash had been delivered at around 1 a.m. on October 5th. The kidnappers confirmed that they had received the $600,000 in cash and assured the family that Bobby was alive and that he would be returned to them over the next 24 hours. Yet unbeknownst to the Greenlease family... Oh, followed by... Followed by the obligatory zonking in the chair after Christmas dinner. Oh my god. I can't remember what meal it was. Was it Christmas? Oh god, like, I ate so much. And listening to your grandpa will smell like a chainsaw. <laughs> oh, man. Okay, I gotta look up this pose again. Yeah, that's pretty much it. The kidnappers had murdered Bobby not long after the abduction. Jeez. And they buried the body in St. Joseph, Missouri, before escaping to St. Louis with the ransom money. Just over a week later, the St. Louis Police Department received a call from a man named John Oliver Hager, who was a driver for the Ace Cab Company in St. Louis. John mentioned that a woman fitting the description of Bobby's kidnapper had been spotted on Arsenal Street in St. Louis and relayed the description of her male companion to law enforcement. The information John provided quickly led to the arrest of one Carl Austin Hall on the evening of October 6, 1953. Later that night, after a huge amount of pressure from the FBI, Carl Hall led a team of agents to an apartment on Arsenal Street in St. Louis, where his girlfriend, Bonnie Emily Hetty, was taken into custody. Both Hall and Hetty were interrogated by FBI agents, and after admitting that they'd kidnapped Bobby, insisted that practically all of the $600,000 ransom money was still in their possession. Hall admitted to planning the kidnapping, the actual abduction of the victim, and to burying the body in the yard of Bonnie Hetty's home, but he flatly denied having murdered the young boy. At first, Hall and Hetty blamed the murder of young Bobby on a man named Tom Marsh, claiming that the boy had still been alive when they'd handed him over. Yet when the FBI pointed out there was a number of inconsistencies with Hall's story, he admitted that he had fabricated the character of Tom Marsh, and that he and Bonnie Hetty were solely to blame for Bobby's death. Hall told investigators that he and Hetty had driven Bobby to Overland Park, Kansas, after which they dragged him from the van, threw him to the ground, then shot him in the head. They then drove the boy's uh. dead body back to St. Joseph, Missouri, where he buried it in Bonnie Hetty's yard and planted flowers on the grave. Bonnie Hetty admitted assisting Hall in the preparation of the ransom letters and notes of instructions to the Greenlease family concerning the payoff of the ransom, as well as going to the school and obtaining custody of the victim using the ruse that his mother was ill. Just before 9 a.m. on October 7th, Bobby's decomposing corpse was discovered by FBI agents, buried near the porch of the Hetty residence at 1201 South 38th Street in St. Joseph, Missouri. His tiny body had been wrapped in a large plastic sheet, and a huge quantity of lime had been poured over his corpse. Agents then located some 38 caliber shell casings, and a ballistic analysis determined that they had been fired from a 38 caliber snub nose revolver that had been found in Hall's possession at the time of his arrest. On October 30th, Carl Hall and Bonnie Hetty appeared before a federal judge in Kansas City, and both pled guilty to the murder of six year old Bobby. After hearing the evidence for little over an hour, the federal judge recommended the death penalty and sentenced both of them to be executed on December 18th of 1953. I think the verdict fits the evidence. The judge was quoted as saying, It's the most cold-blooded, brutal murder I had ever tried. In the end, Carl Hall and Bonnie Hetty were executed together in the Missouri State Penitentiary's lethal gas chamber on December 18th of 1953. Carl was officially pronounced dead at 12.12 a.m., while Bonnie was declared deceased just 20 seconds later. To some, very few murders actually warrant a death penalty, and those that kill are often better left alive to stew in their guilt. Crimes of passion, accidental slayings, or even revenge killings prove that murder is not a black and white issue, and that there are many shades of gray in between. But those that kidnap a six-year-old child collect a ransom, but kill them anyway. 
Some might say that the gas chamber is far too humane a method of execution for people that are capable of such unspeakable evil. Fucking idiots. They didn't even get a chance to spend any of that money. Went through all that Back in the early 90s, Delaware based lawyer. Freaking shitty trouble. To get some ransom. They get it. They don't even, like, deliver on their promises. And then fucking get caught soon after that. Unspeakable evil is always cool. <laughs> Yeah, but like fucking why go through all that trouble to just not spend any of that money? Man. Here, Thomas J. Capano had a life that many of us might find enviable. He was a prominent and prosperous former state prosecutor with high-ranking political connections and even ran a profitable home construction business during his spare time. He also had a large and loving family, consisting of a wife and four daughters. But by 1993, his marriage was falling into a downward spiral. Then right as his marital dissatisfaction was at its peak, he met a young single woman by the name of Anne Marie Fahey. Fahey was employed as a congressional scheduling secretary who had met Thomas Capano after meeting with Congressman Thomas Carper. Capano and Fahey began a romantic relationship shortly afterward, and as much as they tried to keep their affairs under wraps, it became known to an increasing number of friends and co-workers as the years dragged on. Fahey wasn't the only woman that Capano seemed to be having an affair with, but it seems that Fahey was his primary paramour for the following three years. From what I can gather... Capano treated Fahi gently and romantically at first, but as time went by, he grew more and more controlling, overbearing, and violently jealous. When Fahi attempted to end the relationship, Capano refused to allow her to leave him, and told her if she even dared to try, he'd destroy her political career. So instead of risking another confrontation, Fahi reportedly began secretly dating other men and went to great lengths to keep it a secret from Capano. The last known sighting of the couple was on June 27th of 1996, when they met for dinner to once again discuss their relationship. But after that, it was like Anne Fahey had simply dropped off the face of the earth. Two days later, after becoming increasingly concerned for their daughter's safety, the Fahey family reported her missing. Not long after the missing persons report was filed, an agent with the FBI's Baltimore office heard about the case and offered his assistance to local authorities. Then, as the case progressed, various law enforcement agencies agreed to have the FBI take the lead on the investigation, owing to its vast resources and advanced capabilities. When the FBI learned of Fahey and Capano's affair, investigators quickly zeroed in on him as their number one suspect. When questioned by police, Thomas Capano claimed that he had invited Fahi to dinner over in Philadelphia, the goal of which was to resolve the problems in their relationship. He said the evening went well, that they'd come to an amiable agreement after a few hours of conversation, and that afterwards, he'd driven her back home before they parted on good terms. The FBI agents were almost sure that Capano was lying to them, but in order to prove it, the team was forced to use a number of creative investigative techniques to determine what had actually happened that night. This included surveillance, toll record analysis, seizure of emails from Capano's law firm and Fahey's office, analysis of gun purchase records, a four-day search of two landfills, psychological profiling, and analysis of financial records. Finally, after a search of Anne Fahey's apartment, the investigation struck gold. Investigators found a number of handwritten letters addressed to Fahi from Capano, some written with an ominous and threatening tone. They also discovered Fahi's diary with numerous entries describing how Capano was a controlling, manipulative, insecure, jealous maniac. FBI agents then searched Capano's home and personal vehicle for traces of Fahi's blood and hair and quickly found blood stains on a metal radiator cover and some woodwork. 
The FBI then tracked down a blood bank which turned out to have a bag of Fahi's blood that she generously donated weeks earlier. This way, they were able to confirm that it was Fahi's blood in Capano's home and car. A blood bank search helped recover a container of blood that Fahi had donated weeks earlier, and forensic exams linked Fahi's blood to the blood found in Capano's house. As the investigation progressed, there was a kind of surprise twist. Capano's brother, Jerry, was arrested on various drug and weapons charges towards the end of 1997. In exchange for leniency, he admitted that he'd helped Thomas get rid of evidence which proved he'd murdered Fahi. <laughs> According to Jerry, after Thomas Capano murdered his young lover, he forced her body into a large fishing cooler that he had purchased about two months earlier. Then on June 28th, Tom and Jerry Capano drove Jerry's boat some 70 miles <laughs> off Tom the New Jersey coast and dumped the cooler into the Atlantic Ocean. The cooler wouldn't sink, so Jerry shot it full of holes with a shotgun that he kept on board for shark fishing, but the cooler still wouldn't sink. Tom then lifted Fahi's body out of the cooler, wrapped two anchors around it, threw it overboard, and watched it sink. He then threw the cooler back into the water. The same cooler was later discovered by a group of fishermen who pulled it out from the ocean, plugged the bullet holes, and used it to hold the fish that they caught. The following year, <laughs> after the story about the cooler made the news, one of the fishermen got in touch with the FBI and reported his find. The cooler then became a key piece of evidence which tied together Jerry's story. Finally, on November 12th of 1997, the FBI swooped in on Thomas Capano after they learned that he was planning to flee the country. During his trial in 1998, one of Tom Capano's ex-lovers told the court that just over a month before Anne Fahey's murder, Capano told her that if she purchased a pistol with her credit card, he'd purchase it from her for double the price she paid for it. <laughs> with a mountain of damning evidence being turned against him, Capano completely changed his story. He claimed that the pistol-purchasing lover walked in on him and Fahi while they were being intimate, and had been so distraught by the sight that she actually threatened to take her own life with the gun she'd bought. Capano then claimed, as he tried to stop her, the gun went off by accident and killed Fahi. Capano said he then disposed of the body to protect himself and his lover. It made for a compelling story but it was one the jury simply did not believe, and on January 17th of 1999, they pronounced him guilty for the murder of Anne Marie Fahey. Initially, Thomas Capano was sentenced to death for his crimes, but after a lengthy appeals process, his sentence was downgraded to life in prison without parole. Ironically, Capano later instituted his own death sentence in 2011, when his body was found hanging in his prison cell by prison <laughs> uh, it's like you get sentenced to the death penalty and you try to like reduce that and it's like okay we'll give you life in prison I'm like oh shit you may as well be dead or like oh that that's exactly what i wanted because fucking prison life is awesome yeah nope <laughs> he took himself out anyway as an officials Efforts were made to revive him, but it was far too late. Capano was dead by his own hand. Anne-Marie Fahey's body was never officially found, but we can assume that it's somewhere at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, not far from the New Jersey coastline. She might not have received a proper burial, but she certainly got the justice she deserved, as the man who took her life became so racked with pain, regret, and loneliness that he simply couldn't go on living anymore. On the morning of December 16, 1989, an Alabama federal appeals judge named Robert Vance was greeted by a package when he walked out onto his porch. Given that it was the holidays, it wasn't entirely unusual for a gift or two to arrive so Robert thought nothing of picking it up and bringing it inside his and then exploded. home. Once inside, and having nothing suspicious about it, Judge Vance set about opening the package to see what was inside. Inside the small cardboard box was a smaller brown parcel. 
and when Judge Vance tore it open, a loud and devastating explosion ripped through his home. Oh, I called it! Killing him and seriously wounding his wife. The bombing caused a media firestorm, and local police rushed to begin work on what would no doubt be a long and high profile investigation. Yet, just as the investigation was commencing, yet another bombing put an Atlanta based attorney named Robert Robertson in the hospital. Almost immediately after that, two more bomb scares occurred in Georgia and Florida. Jeez. The first was intercepted while being transported to the federal courthouse in Atlanta, while the other was recovered after being mailed to the Jacksonville office of the NAACP. Further bloodshed was averted by the swift and valorous actions of bomb disposal experts in both states. But the someone has a of the two dead bombs was a cold comfort to the general public who were actually aware that more bombs might have been sent out in the mail. But what sick individual would be spiteful enough to send mail bombs during the holidays? Agents from the Federal Bureau of Investigation gathered the remnants of the bombs and packages and sent them off to various laboratories for analysis. Next, U.S. Postal Inspectors worked to learn the path the packages had taken through the postal system, which allowed the FBI to assemble a long list of potential suspects. As federal agents worked their way through the list of suspects, an ATF explosives expert was examining one of the unexploded bombs, only to notice something oddly familiar about its construction. When he reported it to his superior later that day, the explosives expert told them that he not only recognized the design of the bomb, but he could still remember the name of the man who built them that way. Walter Leroy Moody. With the prime suspect identified, the FBI set about surveillance of Walter Moody at home, and at one point, they were able to watch him even closer due to a brief stay in jail. It was during his time in jail that FBI agents discovered that Walter talked to himself, and the FBI realized that bugging his home might result in catching him talking about the bombings. Over the next year, extensive surveillance of Walter Moody revealed his motive for the bombings. The FBI found that Walter had a history of experimenting with explosives, with a conviction for bomb making dating back to the 1970s. According to the trial, Moody had been constructing a bomb in his garage, one that had severely injured his wife when it accidentally exploded. Psychologists determined that Walter's conviction and failed appeals in that case had led him to... Oh, uh, sorry, um... Such a, privilege, such a privilege to watch a master at work. Anyway, late shift tomorrow. I need to get chores done before then. My FBT guide me. Oh. <laughs> well, well, thanks for the donations, Rex. You're fucking awesome. Um, yeah, just ha have a good night and have a good day tomorrow at work. Keep kicking ass and, and taking taking them names. Have a good night. Yeah, Melody says au revoir, me ami, a bon bon pot. I can't read French. I can't read French knees. And Melody says, go have a nap, dude. Yeah, Brax, go take go take your nap. Okay. Harbor a long, festering resentment of the court system. So it came as no surprise when one of the judges on his unsuccessful appeals turned out to be none other than the first victim, Robert Vance. What's more, a surveillance agent had once noted that Moody frequently expressed racially bigoted opinions which tied in with the NAACP being targeted with a bomb. It took just over a year to assemble enough evidence to secure a conviction, and in the summer of 1991, Walter was put on trial for the bombings. The trial was tough, to say the least, and it was a chilling testament to Moody's intelligence that he'd taken every effort to conceal his connection to the bombings. However, on June 28th of 1991... <laughs> But he says, I met you, you plum butt. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I should. 
but um i'm almost done with this story there's like a few like a minute left and i'm making some good progress on this doodle com right here so after the story is done i'll go ahead and take a break and maybe go 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 gadget skis <laughs> and, and give me some some more rock stars Oh, fuck. Oh. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Based on the extensive investigative work of numerous law enforcement agencies, the jury found Walter Moody guilty of more than 70 charges, including murder and attempted murder. In 2018, after once again failing numerous appeals, Walter was finally executed following a last meal of Philly cheesesteaks, Dr. Pepper, and M&M's. It marked the end of a brutal and vengeful man who abused the trust Americans have in their postal service to mail violent death to those that have wronged him. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon. Or click that big join button to learn about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories in big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember to always microwave your M&Ms. That's a thing? Microwaving M&Ms? Oh shit, would they like bug and pop or something? Because like they're 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 coated in candy, right? And if you like get like chocolate hot enough, it'll melt. But then when it's inside like a candy shell, would it like melt and like um maybe steam and expand and like make them pop? Or or or, or would the whole thing just melt? I don't know. Yeah, and I was like, really? Microwaving M&Ms? <laughs> right? That's what I'm saying. That's that's what he said at the end. Yes. Links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember to always microwave your M&Ms. I, I kind of want to try it now just to see if my suspicion is correct. Like, is he trying to, like, fucking make you... Like pop M and M's in your microwave if that's what they do, but then I want to know. I want to know. I want to know. Okay. Okay. It, it's been a very successful donation stream. Oh man. Can't stop rubbing the sleep from my eyes. Fucking all that Sandman. The Sandman is just like fucking throwing dirt in my eyes right now. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and close the stream. It was a very successful stream. Thanks to all those who participated. A big shout outs to, to Melody and the mystery donator who I'm pretty sure now I'm positive was Brex to Landry. <laughs> so thanks you. Thank thanks you. Thank you. <laughs> thank yous go go to like both of them. Melody, who's my lovely moderator, and Brex to Landry really helped me out. Both of you just fucking get digging me out of this like hole that I found myself in. This morning, thanks to HughesNet, and uh, it's going to take a little bit of time to resolve that HughesNet issue. 
um, but I do plan on getting reimbursed. And, and the, thanks to these donations, getting that reimbursement is going to make it a whole lot easier. Not only am I back in, in, in the green, like I'm not in the negative anymore. I, I'll have enough like uh, gas money to like go about doing this whole fucking reimbursement process because I still got to drive all the way out to a UPS store or I'm going to see what like um, Melody suggested and seeing if like you, the UPS can do a pickup of this package and I'll inquire about that once I get the box and get everything packed away but yeah yeah and, and to all those the the lurkers watching or like checking this out later if you like what you saw I forget what to say if you like what you saw please like comment subscribe ring that notification bell donate if you wish you know only if you want to um and any one of those options would be very much appreciated so thank you and this has been Johnston Black Horse, the one and only. I shall check y'all later. Sweet. Bye.